And as Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in the long roads and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour the widows' houses and in the state of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a pen. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. All she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, o Christ. Most Episcopalians are glad when stewardship season is over, including the clergy. And no one has ever told me that they wish that that season ran longer. Although lately our campaigns have been so positive and affirming, maybe that will change. But as a preacher, I'm very glad I don't have to tie that gospel passage to the theme of stewardship. A lot of churches do their campaigns in November. And that means preachers often feel like they have to tell their congregations to give like the widow gave. The widow who is not only poor and marginalized, but also made a gift that represents an enormous sacrifice. Perhaps the difference between sustenance and starvation, life and death. Not only is that an awkward sermon at best, and one that middle class and rich congregations can't relate to, it also ignores the more provocative and profound messages I think this passage is trying to communicate. The question is not how much money should we give, but rather, what does it look like to be faithful in an imperfect context? Jesus doesn't start out talking about money at all. He talks about the scribes, an elite and widely respected class. Jesus challenges the conventional wisdom by portraying them as narcissistic and greedy. The scribes' enjoyment of others' esteem is easy enough to imagine. But what does Jesus mean when he says they devour widows' houses? I mean, that, that's a great visual, but only because it's so outlandish, so far removed from reality. Yet Jesus clearly is trying to make a point. According to a scholar I read, scribes were not only interpreters of religious law, they also had a role in civil law. If a man died, a scribe might be called upon to act as a trustee or administrator of his estate. The scribe would be in a position of incredible power, opportunity, and temptation. He could charge exorbitant fees and collect them out of the estate, even going so far as to taking the widow's home. In those days, a woman without a male relative to stand up for her interests might have little recourse against an unscrupulous scribe. Such abuses were all the more outrageous because scribes were supposed to be experts in Jewish law, which explicitly commands that widows, orphans, and aliens must be taken care of, never taken advantage of. So it's no wonder Jesus was angry with the scribes and warns against them. They betrayed God and expected society's accolades and often received them. That brings us to the widow, or the widows, rather. Our lectionary begins today's readings with the story of Elijah visiting a widow in order to complement the gospel story. And again, this widow is deathly poor. <clears throat> 
Elijah doesn't look very good commanding her to serve him and give him the food that was to be a last meal for her and her son. But the story begins with God telling Elijah to do it so we can cut him some slack. And it all works out fine in the end because the widow's food is miraculously multiplied and all of a sudden there's plenty to go around. The heart of these stories is faith, but we don't get the whole message until we know the context of the stories. In both cases, the widows are profoundly faithful to God, despite a problematic context. For both of them, nothing is more important than serving God, even though they had every reason in the world to look out only for themselves. For both of them, serving God comes first, and that alone is a fine lesson for us and an example for us to follow. But stay with me while we take a broader view. The widow Elijah visited was starving because of a national famine. The famine was caused by a drought. The drought was caused by Elijah, but not because he wanted to hurt anyone. The king at that time was Ahab, a wicked man who worshiped false gods, notably Baal, whose adherents believed he delivered fertility in general and fresh water in particular. Now Elijah, being great in faith, though lacking in subtlety, figured the best way to convince Ahab not to worship Baal was to show him that God, and not Baal, controlled the waters. We might ask, what about all the innocent people who would suffer from a drought? It's important to bear in mind that when biblical authors tell a story, they're telling it in order to make a point. And while it's good to ask questions of the text, the answer may well be, that's not the point of the story. Though Elijah himself faced serious consequences, for calling down the drought. First, he went into exile. Like many bad rulers, Ahab did not take criticism well. So Elijah went into hiding. But the water there dried up, so God then sent Elijah to the widow. Her hospitality is the turning point of the whole story which in turn eventually leads to the spiritual purification of the nation, the dramatic abolition of the Baal worshipers, and the end of the drought. And that hospitality, that encounter between prophet and widow, is a profound display of faith. Elijah was only there because his faithfulness led him to take a huge risk in standing up to an evil king. And the widow, for her part, also showing unconditional faith in God, was making an even greater sacrifice. For while Elijah came there expecting sustenance, the widow expected that the price of feeding Elijah would be a hastened death for her and for her son. Now that's faithfulness. No wonder her story made it into the Bible. What if we were so faithful? Well, the widow's faithfulness was not, as she expected, the end of the story. As presiding bishop Michael Curry would say, God showed up. God answered their prayers. Never mind that wicked king or the idolatrous cult he supported. God showed who's really in charge, and God sustained them in a world that had turned against them. Which brings us back to the gospel story, which also points out profound faithfulness in the context of a harsh reality. On our national calendar today is Veterans Day. I've had the privilege 
of knowing many veterans, and God bless every one of them. Their devotion to our country's highest ideals and most cherished values is certainly commendable and truly humbling in the light of some of their stories of how our country has let them down. And yet, their patriotism is undiminished. I've heard horror stories of veterans treated poorly by civilians and by the country they served. Veterans denied benefits to which they were both morally and legally entitled, every instance of which should be a scandal and a national outrage. And yet, I have never heard any of those vets ever express regret for serving their country. Simply amazing faithfulness. What if all Christians were as faithful to God as vets are to our country? What if all Christians were as faithful to God as the widows in today's stories? Would stories not be written about us? What if all Christians made practicing our faith our highest priority, no matter our context? What if we put God first, even when our lives or our churches aren't perfect, even when following Jesus means taking a risk or paying a price? So long as corruption, famine, and war ravage our world. The church's work is not done. While I do believe that God still shows up, even if I never personally witness a miracle, I will do my utmost to stay faithful. Amen.